Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. So it looks like investors are coming back to Bitcoin in the crypto market after the FTX crash. This is uh, the first instance where we are actually seeing uh, the institutional money coming back. This courtesy of XRP Crypto Wolf here. Market sentiment in the United States around the crypto market is recovering, said the founder of crypto analytics portal CryptoQuant, uh, based on the Coinbase Premium Index. For the first time since the collapse of major cryptocurrency exchange FTX, the index has climbed into the green zone. So Ki Young Ju here. Uh, posting this on Twitter, market sentiment in the U.S. is recovering. BTC hourly price premium in Coinbase has turned positive for the first time since the FTX bank run, as you guys can see. Uh, and as uh, SPF put it in the interview, he's uh, had a bad month. November wasn't so great for cryptocurrency. We had seen negative sentiment, a lot of selling pressure. Uh, institutions were laying off. But now, as you guys can see in here, there is some positive buying pressure again. Uh, for the king cryptocurrency in particular, the index is rising because of increasing trading volume on the exchange, indicating a return of buying power and the start of an accumulation of positions in Bitcoin by these big players. So just taking a look at Bitcoin right now on the chart, we did see the depths over November. And uh, now we're seeing a bit of a pop to the upside. Let me throw that on the hourly uh, and throw that. Whoops auto log, get that off. We have been seeing it over the last few days here and the Bitcoin trend continuing to chug upwards. Right now, Bitcoin is trading just under $17,000. We did hit a high up here of about 17,200 yesterday evening. Taking a look at XRP right now, pretty much dropping sideways on the micro trend. XRP trading at 39 cents. Let's throw that on the, uh, the daily just to get a better sense of where the trend is. So it's also been moving upwards. Uh, since the FTX collapse and, uh, you know, even as a percentage, whoops, on a percentage basis, we have uh, actually seen, and I demonstrated this yesterday on the chart, we have actually seen uh, more of an increase for XRP since that downturn, 23.7% uh, compared to other cryptocurrencies, most notably Bitcoin, where we've seen the price uh, go up, but uh, not as much, only about 9.7% even after that most recent pop for Bitcoin. But now we are seeing institutions uh, accumulating and uh, we are in the green. So that's positive news. Uh, I don't know if you guys, uh, if, you, if you live in the United States, I don't know if you guys received this. Michael Branch was asking if anybody else has received this from Uphold. Um, because cryptocurrency regulations are so close, these exchanges now have to do their due diligence and ask you for your tax information. <laughs> It's unfortunate, but it is the way it goes. So uh, this one uh, specifically from Uphold. Changes to the U.S. tax legislation per the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act have expanded the reporting requirements of the cryptocurrency industry. And so uh, you have to fill out this form, uh, this W-9 form by December 9th. If you do not submit your W-9 by this date, we'll have no option but to restrict your account. So just be mindful, guys, if you guys are using Uphold, and I'm sure it's not limited to the Uphold exchange, but uh, many other cryptocurrency exchanges as well. You will likely have to fill this form or uh, similar forms out. There is a silver lining, though. This, to me, screams that the industry, anxious to get cleared for regulatory clarity, and, uh, you know, the fact that now we are filling out these types of forms. I had to fill one out for my exchange just a few weeks ago, or maybe it was even last week. Um, they are serious about cryptocurrency clarity. So, of course, the Ripple lawsuit is going to play a big part in this. And, uh, you know, this is just another step that we're going to have to take, unfortunately, uh, cryptocurrency is changing guys right before our eyes and it's to prevent scams like this. This from Concoda here on Twitter, get this SBF admitted that exchanges like FTX issued fake Bitcoin. How do you think they will pay out yield in Bitcoin once their entire supply has been mined? Fractional reserve Bitcoin. And guys, here's the source from a Twitter spaces event. We have Rand Nooner here talking to Sam Bankman fried. Listen to this. Because that makes sense as to why there were no more Bitcoin to withdraw, where customers like, right. like that I know had Bitcoin balances, because those Bitcoin right. actually didn't exist, because it was just notional. You were just letting us buy notional tokens that didn't actually really exist. Uh, yeah, or another way of phrasing that. Because would otherwise be you would have had to have the USDC uh, somewhere. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I believe that what you're saying is, in fact, part of what happened. What? <laughs> I believe that what you said is actually what happened. So it sounds like he's fessing up to it. Uh, not surprised. New Genesis had Dan Friedberg on the horn and filmed this exchange. Now, if you guys don't remember Dan Friedberg, uh, I believe he was uh, Alameda and FTX's in-house counsel lawyer. He also did run that uh, online bet website back uh, in 2008, some kind of scam betting website. 
Anyway, it was being mentioned here that FTT tokens were actually created out of thin air, not backed by anything, and that they were in fact counterfeit. And uh, it basically was being grilled in this secret interview that was taped. I'm gonna play you guys a little bit of this. Listen to this. We're right. Yeah. You know, somehow the liquid, I don't know liquid. They may have counterfeited the coin. Every centralized, every centralized exchange creates a synthetic, okay? For the purpose yeah, of trying. I mean, all we did is just push a button through an exchange, you know? You know, we didn't intend to do that, certainly. We just, uh, you know, we had the new coin in our exchange account. We sent it to you using the exchange account. Yeah. And it's possible, who knows? Yeah. I don't know. All right. You know, it's because like, that's not on the blockchain. Fair enough. But one thing we will, but we do agree, if we're right, we're going to make world history, aren't we? And this is going to get a lot of public attention as you now, now put it on the table. Let's get some public attention on this. And you explain where the, where the fuck our coins are. Yeah, no, I, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, and I'm going to leave it there. It goes on for another two minutes uh, with these guys just arguing about the situation. I will leave this clip in the description of the video. I just wanted you guys to hear him say it. Uh, that FTT tokens were likely counterfeited and actually had zero value. So this one just courtesy of Nerd Nation Unboxed here on Twitter. And uh, the source is also down here if you want to watch uh, the full interview. So again, this is just a three minute clip of the interview. Of course, this turmoil has caused the crypto sector unbelievable pain. And so now we are in a new era. This is why people like Michael Branch are getting uh, emails like this from Uphold. These exchanges are dying to be regulatory compliant. And, uh, you know, even as per Michael Barr here, now let me remind you guys, Michael Barr is the vice chair of the Federal Reserve for Supervision. Michael Barr also used to be on Ripple's board. I believe he joined back in 2015. This one courtesy of 801 underscore XRP on Twitter. Listen to what Michael Barr says in this interview. Outside the banking sector, I have to ask you about the uh, turmoil um, in uh, the crypto sector. Uh, what, what's your, what's your view on that vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, financial regulation on, on everything we've, we've, we've been seeing happening? Well, I think Michael, it, it's a, a pretty good example of what happens when you have firms that are trying to set themselves up to avoid, uh, a regulate regulatory structure. You know, we have very well-established rules, uh, for exchanges. We have well-established rules for custody. We have well-established rules uh, with respect to anti-fraud measures. We have uh, rules about lending out customer funds or using customer funds. Uh, so, you know, if we uh, had a regulatory system uh, that uh, was applying fully at full force to that sector, uh, I, I think that, you know, we would have had the ability to, to minimize some of those risks that we saw. Now, thankfully, the risks to the core of the financial system have been pretty muted in the aggregate. Um, th there aren't uh, today tight linkages between the financial sector and, and the crypto sector at a, at a very large level. We have some small, small sets of interactions uh, with the traditional banking system uh, where there might be risks, but not at a broad scale. And, and so I think it's really important as we go forward in thinking about uh, regulation of, of uh, crypto-related assets and activities that we think about those risks. I, I also want to be clear at the same time, Michael, it's important for us not to set, to set up a regulatory uh, environment that stifles innovation. Right there, guys, if you just noticed, he put on his Ripple board member cap. The U.S. government should not be creating uh, regulation that stifles innovation. Uh, innovation is really critical to the financial sector. It's critical to the American economy. It's one of the reasons we have amazingly vibrant uh, economic system is because we permit, encourage, allow and, uh, that kind of innovation. And so we've got to get the balance right. We have to have really good guardrails so that investors and consumers are protected, so that the safety and soundness of the financial system is protected. And then we need to let innovation flourish within those guardrails. So innovation needs to be able to still flourish in the United States. And, you know, crypto clarification and, uh, you know, some of these definitions are changing day by day. I saw this from Heidi at Blockchain Chick on Twitter. CFTC chairman has just changed his mind about Ethereum now being a commodity. So it's looking like maybe Bitcoin will be the only one considered to be a commodity. Uh, Rostin Benham, chairman of the CFTC, has walked back previous claims that Ether and other altcoins should fall under his agency's jurisdiction. 
speaking about the future regulation of crypto following FTX's bankruptcy. He suggested that only Bitcoin should be viewed as a commodity. As uh, reported by Fortune Magazine, the chairman aired his thoughts during an invite-only crypto event, uh, the time slot once allotted for XFTS, uh, XFTX uh, chief Sam Bankman-Fried, or SBF, uh, these acronyms are killing me, had instead by filled by a panel titled The Demise of FTX and Other Crypto Entities Lesson Learned. So now we've got Benham here uh, walking back on uh, the original position. If you guys don't remember, Benham used to be at the SEC with Gary Gensler. Uh, and so he says, you know, many digital assets constitute commodities as recognized by the DCCPA, the CFTC's expertise and experience make it the right regulator for the digital asset commodity market. And so this is changing uh, basically in real time, guys. And the FTX collapse definitely has something to do with it. Um, we've also got Brian Brooks here talking a little bit about the financial system and almost sending a few pot shots uh, in the direction of the powers that be. Listen to this. Why is crypto so controversial? Why does so many people hate it? Why, why does, you know, Senator Warren give talks about the shadowy super coders who are fleecing Americans and this and that? It's because money has always been controversial. And what we're doing here is we're creating a new system of money. And that is always going to be culturally controversial. You have to have the courage of what you're building here. Money is the foundation on which we all generate wealth. So money is controversial. This from Brian Brooks. We know he's a huge proponent of cryptocurrency, crypto adoption, uh, blockchain and DLT development in the United States. He once held the position of the controller of the currency and he's spitting truth bombs like nobody's business. You know, government doesn't want us to know this. Money is controversial. Currency is controversial. The way we move money over the last 100 years or so has been, you know, it's been the status quo. They've been happy with the way it works because there is central control at the top and bankers, big banks are essentially losing their power. And, uh, you know, obviously the legacy banking system in the United States specifically doesn't want this to happen. They do not want this decentralization of money. They want to maintain control. This is where a lot of profits come from. And to that point, Stefan Hubert uh, posted this, a fascinating interview with Bernie Madoff. And this is what he said on a TV talk show shortly before his Ponzi scheme was exposed. Okay. Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan make most of their money by providing liquidity. And he raves about how the SEC makes it impossible to violate the rules with their enforcement. Listen to this interview. And guys, again, I think this was from the early 2000s, so years ago now. And keep in mind what he says about liquidity. In the large investment banks, the great majority of their income takes from, uh, comes from risk taking. In other words, proprietary trading, put the, putting the firm's own capital, uh, providing liquidity to institutions or, or to, to individual investors, primarily inst institutions. That's where the money is made. And, and is this something like when you're doing all this trading for other people, it, is that something that is, I, I've just never fully understood, is that a completely separate operation? Is there information going back between people who are doing the trades and the ones who are taking the bets or? Well, yeah, there's, I mean, there, there are Chinese, so-called Chinese walls that are required to be established at every brokerage firm so that the, uh, there are in, what they call information barriers, is a better you know, term that most people would understand, to sort of wall off uh, a, a brokerage firm from taking advantage of information that he has as to what clients are basically going to trade or not going to trade. So there are separate there are separate divisions within the firms and it's very and it is uh, very very uh, carefully enforced uh, and surveilled so that there are these very it doesn't mean there are not abuses for sure but by and large uh, it, it, you know, in today's regulatory environment, it's virtually impossible to, to violate rules. And this is something that the public really doesn't understand. And you, if you read things in the newspaper and you see somebody, you know, violate a rule, you say, well, you know, they're always doing this. But you, it's impossible for you to go under, for a violation to go undetected. Okay, I'm going to leave it there, guys. I will link this in the description if you want to watch the rest of it. Just wanted to go down here, though. Another comment with regards to this, what Bernie Madoff was saying all those years ago and bringing it back to Ripple and XRP. Stefan Hubert says that is why Ripple is the enemy of these big banks and the SEC. Offering a product that can provide liquidity quickly and practically for free is a real disruptor. This is why, guys, the legacy banking system in the United States trying to be protected by guys like Gary Gensler. This is why we're seeing this kind of charade uh, why we're seeing, you know, examples like the Ripple SEC lawsuit 
Ethereum with proof of stake and its fees, just a continuation of Wall Street and the SEC business model. So a great clip here from Stefan Hubert, uh, and he does post the full link. It is listed on YouTube here if you guys uh, want to check that out. This is you, Gary Gensler, says just Bellhaven. Uh, John Davidson here uh, says everyone is giving Sam way too much credit comparing him to Bernie Madoff. Sam can't eloquently answer a difficult question, let alone carry a conversation. Madoff ran his Ponzi scheme for 20 plus years. Sam lasted three, not even close. So with regards to this, the big banks providing liquidity, Ripple being a disruptor. So has their grand plan been revealed? This from Anders here. Are we seeing the master plan of making XRP the most liquid crypto asset starting to play out? Put it together here. So he, uh, he he posts this short tweet thread in three parts. Start by watching Darren's video from nine minutes. So this is from Darren Moore, XRP Darren on Twitter. At the nine minute mark, he talks a little bit about the XRP liquidity pool. So um, I'm just going to, whoops, that's uh, just a, a screenshot of it. Going to click on that YouTube link. Listen to this. ODL users and RippleNet partners can tap into liquidity on chain and then use ODL to convert XRP to local fiat currency. The XRP ledger becoming more and more liquid means that it can support more utility. This increased liquidity also provides opportunities for large institutions to move money through the XRP ledger, potentially using our liquidity pools and paying us fees as they swap in and out of assets. On-chain liquidity paired with local fiat conversion through ODL makes this a seamless platform for moving money. The more liquid this becomes, the more demand there will be for XRP since it's necessary for wallets and transaction fees on the XRP ledger. Since it's so efficient, it will be the cheapest possible method. And with cheap prices, we as a decentralized community are competing with correspondent banks. So guys, we are going to be those liquidity providers. Again, bringing it back to automated market makers, why XRP is going to be so valuable. The more liquid it is, the more valuable it's going to be. And who are the holders? We, you and I, uh, we're, well, we're some of the holders. Obviously, there are other entities as well that hold XRP in larger quantities by and large. Uh, but you and I, we also hold XRP. So we are also going to be those market makers providing liquidity to the market. Uh, and again, the more liquidity there is, the more valuable it's going to be. Let me continue with this tweet thread down here. Okay, from Bob Way back in the day, I believe this was from 2019. Liquidity is a generalized problem that all teams need to solve as they try to build out a multi-currency payment network. When Ripple thinks the time is right, they will start to talk about their plans for solving that problem. Remember guys, the dates are very important here. Back in 2019, I know that was when Bob Way um, started to kind of pop up in the XRP community, but this statement could have actually been from before. Uh, this was before ODL. This was way before the whole idea of liquidity pools, borrowing XRP for liquidity on credit. All those ideas came after this. And Bob Way was foreshadowing this idea way back when. When Ripple thinks the time is right, they will start to talk about their plans for solving that problem. Fast forward to today. And here we are, David Schwartz mentioning the planned secret sauce, guys. This was back from July of this year, which is the AMM or the automated market maker. Now, even if ODL wouldn't connect with the decentralized exchange slash liquidity pool at this moment, we don't know what Ripple has planned for the future. David has also said XRapid or ODL is not aimed at banks. So just uh, tweeting at the screen grabbed here for the first time, this reveals the planned secret sauce as continuous auction mechanisms that incentivizes arbitragers to burn liquidity tokens and arbitrage soon more accurately and more frequently to increase the benefits to liquidity providers. So guys, that is you and I, also everybody else holding XRP. We are the liquidity providers. And this sounds as though it is the master plan taking over the system with XRP liquidity. Of course, it is more efficient. And so, you know, what Bernie Madoff was describing all those years ago, that traditional system, now we're seeing it become disrupted. So is the master plan playing out right before our eyes? And is it only a matter of time before XRP has that true value, a high enough value for you and I to start trading it and becoming those market makers? That's just my opinion, but I want to hear what you guys think. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.